So the next speaker is actually our Fowler Award for Geophysics winner. So I'm going to introduce her by reading out the citation. This is for Dr. Catherine Reichert, who's won the Fowler Award for Geophysics. Dr. Catherine Reichert is the 2015 winner of the Fowler Award of the Royal Astronomical Society. Dr. Reichert's work focuses on imaging the tectonic plate and constraining the mechanism that defines it. She investigated what makes a plate plate-like on a variety of scales and in a variety of tectonic environments. She imaged the lithosphere as thin as sphere boundary between East and North America using scattered waves, showing that it is too sharp to be just a thermal gradient. Another mechanism is required, and this may be a change in composition or the appearance of melt. She built on this work, adapting it to the global scale and finding sharp boundaries in a variety of tectonic environments. She went on to expand her results to oceanic areas, developing a novel SS waveform method to deal with situations where there are few seismic stations. Recently, she has focused on the lysosphere as thinosphere boundary at the continent to seafloor spreading transition in the Ethiopian rift and at subduction zones. Dr. Reichert's impressive body of significant contributions in this field makes her one of the world's leading young seismologists. For these reasons, Dr. Catherine Reichert is awarded the Royal Astronomical Society's Fowler Prize. So that means I can now introduce the talk formally after trying not to trip my way through that jumble of long words and syllables which is clearly designed to trip up the RAS president. Uh, so for the final award, Catherine is going to talk about what defines a tectonic plate. Over to you. Thanks a lot. I want to thank the uh, conveners um, for inviting me here today. Um, and for also for a really nice introduction. Um, that was really nice. Too much jargon, maybe, but yeah. <laughs> so, um, so today uh, I'm going to be talking about what defines a tectonic plate. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge my, my co authors here um, um, and, and collaborators um, at the bottom of the slide. Okay, so the tectonic plate, otherwise known as the lithosphere, uh, corresponds to the coherent layer at the surface of the Earth that, that moves kind of together as a single um, body. Uh, and this is in contrast to the weaker layer beneath it that we refer to as the asthenosphere. And very classically, uh, we've defined this boundary thermally. Uh, so it's well known that temperature has a large effect on the strength of rocks, so that makes a lot of sense. And we define it typically as you know, the location where the geotherm, the conductively cooled Earth, um, kind of intersects with the adiabat. And, and that's where um, generally we put that kind of base of the plate. Uh, however, that precise depth is not really well um, known or understood. And in fact, putting tighter constraints on it has proved quite challenging. So this is some work um, from the early 90s where they looked at just waveform bounces and they were looking for discontinuities that might be related to something like, like uh, the base of a plate. And in fact, they found no evidence for it um, globally or even in regional situations. And so the idea was, well, perhaps this boundary is um, very weak in the seismic signature. So I'm, I'm a seismologist, so I'm going to talk a lot about seismic waves. Um, uh, or perhaps this, the phases that would be associated with it are really close to other, uh, other major discontinuities in the Earth, such as the, the base of the crust, the moho. Perhaps it's not very significant globally, or it could be very gradual, and that would correspond to the thermal definition. And that's kind of what most people went on with is, OK, well, we probably have something that's very gradual. Alternatively, it could be. Um, something that's um, variable in depth, which would be very, very difficult to, to detect at these kind of broader wavelengths, um, larger scale features. And you know, I, I mentioned that it's very difficult to detect seismically um, at, 
kind of in a global sense. Um, but then what's happened, and, and we, we kind of most people have moved on to thinking of it thermally, but what's happened is there have been many observations in this depth range in the past couple of decades that show that um, there's some pretty sharp boundaries in here. Um, however, it's, it's really difficult to kind of scale these up to a, a global scale and, and make some generalizations. So, so but the observation of sharp boundaries in that depth range makes people question whether or not a, a thermal gradient can really define them because a thermal gradient really um, needs to be quite gradual over, say, 100 kilometers or more. And when I say sharp, I mean sharper than that. So, so look, we're using seismic frequencies that you know, you'd need something that is quite sharp to define them, the, the, the discontinuities that we see. Um, the other thing that we see a lot are boundaries that are at constant depth across the ocean. Uh, so a thermally defined ocean plate would necessarily thicken with age in a predictable way, right? And if, if you see something that at a constant depth across the ocean, that doesn't make any sense with a thermal boundary. So, so those two things together um, have led many people to, to think, well, Maybe um, this classic thermal definition is okay at first order, but we need something more complicated to, um, to, to really describe our observations. So that's what I'm going to be, going to be talking about today. Um, some waveforms that have been used uh, <laughs> include things like receiver functions. So these are um, shear waves or transverse waves that arrive at, um, that, are, that travel from a distant earthquake and convert to a compressional wave before arriving at a seismic station. And then also um, compressional waves, or P waves, that convert to a shear waves before arriving at a seismic station. And so those are really high frequency, they have good high, fre high frequency contents in comparison to some of the other waves that we use. And that's what allows us to put very tight constraints on things like that I was talking about, like the, the seismic velocity gradient that you would see at the base of a tectonic plate. Of course, there's a bunch of other phases that are, you're gonna, uh, um, arrive and complicate things, but I'm not going to go into that today. Okay, so it's not that we never image the plate tectonically, actually, uh, seismically. In fact, recently we've been doing a really good job with this with surface waves. So surface waves are these long period waves that travel across the Earth, uh, the surface of the Earth, and they find seismically fast, rigid lithospheres that extend to about 200 kilometers beneath the interiors of the continents, and then thin to about something like you know, 90 or here, about 90-ish 90, 90 kilometers at the continental margin in the east. This is a, a transect going across eastern North America. So that's really great, but the thing is these waves are so um, low frequency that they cannot resolve exactly how this gradient occurs. All that they can say is that there's a change from, from fast velocity to slow velocity, but they can't say whether it occurs as a step function or it occurs over something like 40, 50 kilometers depth. And that's really the key to constraining what mechanism defines it. If it occurs over greater depths, it can be defined thermally, but if it's very sharp, it really needs a mechanism. And the things that we think about in the mental that might define this boundary or affect the, the, the strength of the rocks are things like hydration in the mantle or a small amount of partial melting. And so we looked at this velocity gradient at the edge of the continental keel here in eastern North America, or the continental margin, using those uh, receiver function results that I showed in the previous slide. And what we found, it was a really strong sharp boundary, like a 5 to 10 percent velocity drop that occurred over less than 11 kilometers depth. So that was really strong and sharp at the time. That was a really big deal. Um, since then, many people have found things of this order, okay? Uh, but what that told us is that when we do geodynamic modeling, um, we, it absolutely can't be defined by temperature. And we need some kind of other mechanism, like I was saying, something like a, a, a boundary in, from a depleted and dehydrated lithosphere to a, a more hydrated or undepleted asthenosphere, or a small amount of partial melting. Okay. So that's great. But, uh, well, where did, w w we were wondering, because we had these very high um, resolution results beneath eastern North America, does this, is this special um, because we're sitting at the edge here of the keel or, you know, because we, we can have these kind of very complicated convection patterns here that somehow allow a small amount of melt, partial melt to be produced. Um, we weren't really sure. So we wanted to expand this uh, to a global scale and really find out um, what defines this boundary globally. So uh, what I did is expand this out to the global database at the time um, 
and look for sharp boundaries. And what I found is that there are sharp boundaries uh, nearly everywhere where I have structure that's simple enough that allow, like uh, you know, I showed you that there are a bunch of bounces that you might see that would be complicated. But so you have to look at places with simple structure, but where, where we have simple structure, you can clearly see velocity discontinuities that are strong and sharp globally. And there seems to be a tectonic trend where you have shallower discontinuities beneath the ocean that increase in depth towards the continental interior, as you might expect. So this is really um, interesting and, and very cool at the time. But <laughs> this is something that we point out in this paper and, and, and many people have pointed out since. It's the depth in the interior of the continents is about 100, maybe up to 120 kilometers. And that is so shallow um, compared to what we know from other, other constraints. And so that was shocking and, 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 and <clears throat> said something, well, it said that what we're, what, we're, what we're calling the LAB may not always be the LAB, right? So, so here are some of the other things that tell you that it can't be the base of the plate in the continents. So for instance, um, surface waves on these global scales show that the seismically fast lid extends to at least 150 or even a 200, maybe even 200, 250 kilometers depth in comparison to the ocean. So that, so, so that anomaly must persist to greater depth. And if you put in a sharp boundary at 120 kilometers, then the, and it's defined by melt or by water, then that deeper material will necessarily conduct away, or convect away, sorry. And, um, and, and, and this anomaly will not persist any longer. And the other thing is we know from things like diamonds, which have the stability field in this, these cold, deep continents, uh, they, um, they show us that, the, the, that, these, that these cold, deep continents need to also extend to at least 150 or so, or so kilometers depth. So it doesn't really make a lot of sense to have a, a boundary in hydration or melting beneath the continent. So that's quite interesting. Um, it means that what we're seeing beneath the interior of the continents um, is something different. And these kind of sharp boundaries have been seen, actually, it's really interesting if you look back in the literature, because active source experiments, we can't do these any longer. A lot of these involve um, passive nuclear explosions, but um, they had these really neat results where they showed that there were, there were these strong, sharp boundaries at near lithospheric depths that were not really easily explainable by temperature. So this is kind of, we're getting back to what people had seen before, but putting, you know, we've got much more um, in terms of um, the seismic coverage of the, the Earth now, so we are able to say that, that these exist over much greater areas, and there, there really are something to pay attention to. Um, and we have this, is, I, I like this figure because it has a very similar <laughs> interpretation to what a lot of studies are seeing now, that kind of towards the edges of the, edges of the continents, that it's likely associated with the actual tectonic plate, whereas within the continental interiors, we have something very interesting going on um, that's not related to the tectonic plate uh, because we know that it extends deeper. So. Um, that's pretty cool. Anyways, so the, the, the interior of the continents is complicated and suggests that, 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 that there must be something, that, that there's more complicated discontinuity structure. And the mechanism that is, defines those discontinuities within the continents is just a, a really debatable right now. Um, it's very difficult because we have these very strong, tight constraints from many studies. And then, um, but there's no real easy mechanism that can easily define them with, without you know, with keeping that stable continent there. So people have proposed things like, oh, there could be some slab stacking that form the continents. And the, so, so an oceanic lithosphere that was stacked on top of each other over and over again, and that we could be seeing these remnant slabs stacking. So that's really neat, and that would be a really cool implication. Um, other people have suggested that it might be a more of an entire continent scale feature where you have this kind of chemical layering. Um, also, um, the idea that there, there's some kind of variation in fabric that's defining these things. The, the jury is still really out on, on what exactly is going on, and um, I'm not going to get into the details of all of these arguments right now, um, but happy to, to discuss them later. Uh, but you know, I think that, it, that what will come out of this is really a better understanding of the formation of the continents, which is very cool. Um, this is some work that we've recently been doing looking at the Anton Java Plateau, uh, which is a huge hunk of lithosphere that was it's, it's buoyant and it's resisting going down into the subduction zone where it's being pulled um, right by Papua New Guinea here. And um, it's hypothesized to be a proto-continent. A proto so it was formed by this large, they think, melting event that um, 
you know, cause this residual mantle to exist that's more rigid and more buoyant than the surrounding lithosphere. And what we see is also some kind of signature from the, the base of the, of, the, of the tectonic plate, but then also something that we think is a mid lithospheric discontinuity, perhaps caused by a variation in these frozen in melt boundaries. Okay, so um, what I just showed you is that you know beneath the continents we might we ha might have these sharp frozen in boundaries. I'm oh, sorry, it's a bit cut off here, but um, we, we might have these uh, sharp frozen in boundaries that are related to the formation of the continents. Uh, whereas beneath the oceans uh, we have just very few constraints, um, and that's why I like to talk about the oceans next. Uh, the oceans, on the other hand, you know have a much simpler tectonic history. The, those continents have been around for billions of years, right? Whereas the oceans have just formed. We have, I mentioned this a bit before, but we have these already um, well quantified ideas um, for how the plate will thicken with age um, and also how we expect the gradient, the, the seismic velocity gradient at its base to vary. So you can see here we expect, this is a, just a variety of plate ages, um, we expect the plate to uh, cool um, and how the temperature profile should look in depth and then also how we can extrapolate those to seismic velocities and they should be quite gradual. So that's really where we'd like to look. The problem is that we don't have many seismic stations on the ocean floor. They are very, we, we can put them there, but they're very expensive um, to put down and um, also it's quite noisy at the, the, the base of the ocean. So there's a lot of logistical um, issues in doing it. So there's been very, very few, you can count them on your hand, uh, um, decent sized, like large regional scale kind of um, ex ocean bottom experiments. But what we know from surface waves, um, which I've mentioned before, is that you know overall first order we do see a, a thickening of the plate with age. Of course, it doesn't um, actually correspond to a single isotherm. There's some funniness where uh, we often see shallowing as the at, at old plate ages, um, but we see this in global studies here, and also <laughs> we see it in re regional results from in situ measurements. So, so that um, that's means that temperature does play a role, which we've always known, okay? But the problem with this is that there are these classic transect studies where uh, these um, earthquakes uh, in the Southwest Pacific were used, um, recorded in, in this case um, in the Western United States, and they have these um, very nice bounce patterns and they're used to invert robustly in, in, you know, in several studies. This has been shown over and over again that there's this large drop in seismic velocity and it's sharp, um, occurring over less than 30 kilometers. And so they say this cannot be thermal. It's, it occurs at the same depth across all of this huge, you know, all of these ocean ages across the Pacific. And so it must be related to the melting zone that, that, that creates the plate. And that's, that's what we're seeing there. So that was. That's uh, their interpretation, which is much different than what I just showed you with the surface waves, right? So there's still these long-standing conundrums with the, with the oceans. And I was looking at this using these SS bounces. So I'm looking at this, they have a sensitivity here because they're bouncing off the, the base of the plate, right? Uh, and so these are, these are hundreds of thousands of bounce points here that I'm using um, across the, the Earth to look at this in greater detail. And I'm not going to go into the detail, but just say that <laughs> We imaged a discontinuity that increases in depth that's, um, from you know, regions that are close to the ridge out to older ages. And it seemed to lie along an isotherm, which is pretty exciting. Um, and that was, you know, I, I, <laughs> well, this is really an interesting result at the time, but then what happened was lots of groups were really interested in imaging this boundary across the ocean. And this is all of their results that came out within, you know, about five years of each other here. And it just became a giant mess, <laughs> okay? Um, this is the predicted isotherms, and it really wasn't following any of these. There's some people who thought it was going straight across, and then some people who didn't. Um, it was a mess. So, okay. I was looking to bring this all together, and what upsets me less is kind of discrepancies in depth. There are less of those, and any ones that do exist are probably from different sensitivities of different waveforms. The more upsetting thing to me is that these classic waveform studies went, go straight through the Pacific here. The details of this plot you can completely ignore. There, there's a lot of complicated things. But you know, the, 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 the transect studies that show a constant depth discontinuity, it's a huge discontinuity. There are other studies in the same exact area, and these are all, shown by the large gray area here, 
that that have no discontinuity in that depth range. And so that was what was shocking to me and, and, and really kind of uh, said something about what's going on here. Um, and what it is, I think, is that anisotropy, which we brought up in the continents, I don't know if you remember before, um, uh, is that basically if you have an, a fabric, and we know that fabric exists in the Earth um, since olivine, which is a, a, a very common mineral in the mantle, is strongly anisotropic, and so it has a seismic velocity that's much stronger in one direction than the rest. Um, this can cause this kind of strong discrepancy if all of your earthquakes are going in one direction, like those transect studies are. And so what I showed in this paper is that you only get the phases, that, you know, the, the predicted base of the plate phase if you're going in that one direction, and then all other directions you should not get it. And that's exactly what we showed, is that other directions we don't see that phase at all. And so we need to be very conscious of these variations that in um, anisotropic fabric. So there's been a lot of work that has come out um, kind of based on these ideas of anisotropy changing, but they're very hand wavy because it's very difficult to explain the polarity of the phases being consistent, mostly always negative, consistent with a velocity decrease with depth, um, and have azimuthal anisotropy because I just showed you, for instance, in this figure that you only get that one that negative polarity in one direction. So, uh, <clears throat> so there's you know there's a lot of hand wavy explanations for what this can be. It can also be a change in the degree of horizontal orientation, which can give you a consistent polarity. However, it can't give you a very big <coughs> value in terms of the absolute um, value of the velocity contrast. So. Um, so there's a lot of discrepancy in terms of regional results versus global scale results right now in terms of you know, exactly what's going on. Um, but this is really important stuff um, for understanding what makes a tectonic plate. So this is a, a recent result um, which tries to put a simple um, spin on it with radial isotropy versus azimuthal. But like, as I just said, it, uh, it struggles to explain some of our very tight constraints from individual studies. Then there's um, some really interesting results that have suggested it might be even w more complex than this, where the, uh, they show that there's these anomalies that are kind of fingering out across the Pacific. And this might be because you have the mantle flowing in this fingered way, or you could have Richter rolls, um, which would cause even more complicated anisotropy. So um, <laughs> this has to be further investigated as well, because it ha would have a strong influence on it and might explain some of the very strange things that we've been seeing. Um, although. You know, this is not. You know, they're still working on really getting a good resolution on exactly uh, what those fingers might look like. So then there was this really recent. Okay, there was this recent Stern paper uh, that came out in Nature this earlier this year, and this is one of the. You know, it's really important to pay attention in detail, and that's kind of what I'm saying for a lot of these global studies. Is that uh, he was able to put he put um, seismometers here across New Zealand, and um, sorry, and then he set off these explosions. And he was lucky enough to get these strong reflections off the top and, and also the, the bottom of the downgoing plate, Well, what he interprets as the bottom. And he found this really strong contrast. It was about 8%. So that is exactly what I'm talking about when I'm saying, oh, like it's hard to reconcile these individual results with um, what we know about things like olivine. So for instance, he, so he imaged this channel right here using the seismic waves. And uh, the, you know, the channel can't be explained by anisotropy alone, which many of these groups would like, uh, if the anisotropy, if there's any anisotropy at all within the lithosphere, at, you know, and, and, and maybe, maybe uh, you know, we have very few constraints on anisotropy within the lithosphere. We have strong constraints that there's really strong anisotropy, like this really strong fabric right beneath the crust. We know that from these classic studies where ships went around in the ocean and um, put up, um, with active source experiments basically showing that there's really strong alignment in, in, the, in the shallow mantle. We have few constraints here. It's often assumed that, of course, the plate is forming here and that strong fabric would form because it's forming in this very simple way. But uh, um, unless you, know, you have none at all, it's really hard to explain his um, constraint on absolute velocity uh, change. So, so, so that's the really cool thing about that paper, and it's something that you know we have to work on bringing when we bring all these things together. Okay, so this is what I just said that we know that there's very strong anisotropy at the base of the crust. Okay, so I just want to talk for a minute about the future. Um, like I said, there's been very few in situ seismic experiments on the seafloor. 
Um, fortunately, I'm involved with um, a few really big ones that are going out in the near future. Um, and these are really exciting because seismic instrumentation from the seafloor has gotten much bigger, uh, much better um, in terms of uh, the instrumentation in the past 10 years. And so we have one experiment to look at volatile variation uh, in the Antilles. And here we have a huge variation in sediment content from um, the south by South America um, to, to very, few, very little sediment in the north. We also have these strong fracture zones um, in the Atlantic plate, which is a very rarely studied plate. Uh, those might carry a large amount of hydration deep into the mantle, and we should be able to image that seismically. The other thing that we're doing is looking at the, the mid-Atlantic ridge with a, a whole bunch of ocean bottom seismometers and uh, well, some more detail about blah, blah, but, um, but uh, what we should be able to do here is, uh, uh, here, I'll, I'll just say, um, we're, we're looking, yeah, at the very, you know, basically zero age lithosphere out to 40 million year old lithosphere using seismic instruments um, and also magnetotelluric instruments. And there's also active source studies that are going on. And so we should be able to use the complementary um, sensitivities of these phases to really get at the mechanism that defines the plate. And this is the seismic line that just went out using the Slumberger um, super long streamer here. And uh, so we've had to move our, the location of our, our, our study a little bit because there were some political boundary issues. But um, that's another story. And uh, we have this uh, experiment now that's going to be just a little bit further south than what I showed before, uh, where we're looking at using seismic and MT um, together with these. The idea is that, we'll, again, we're going to be, we're going to be able to test um, whether or not the, the plate thickens with age, um, how sharp that boundary is, and whether or not there's a, a compositional boundary at, at constant depth. Great. So um, in conclusion, the lithosphere asthenosphere boundary is defined by a mechanism such as hydration or melt in many locations globally. Um, but some sharp discontinuities may be frozen in, particularly within the continents. Anisotropic fabric is really important and it influences our results. And it seems like um, by itself, it's not a very simple thing to define all the things that we're seeing seismically, but it's certainly really important in understanding what we're seeing. So um, more detailed investigations are required um, for better understanding, um, especially including in situ measurements uh, beneath, the, um, beneath the oceans. So thanks. So time for some questions. Yes, can you go for the microphone? In your slide on uh, anistropy, there appeared to be, uh, there are a whole lot of individual graphs there, there appeared to be something happening at around 100 million years, and it seemed to sort of flatten out there. Yeah, yeah. Then on your last slide, the sort of flattening out seemed to start much, much earlier, about 10 million years, and you had this damp and something mm -hmm. else. Yeah, yeah. Um, what's the significance of these age-related uh, curves? Yeah, so, so, it's, so, uh, so basically, the substance of the ocean is well known that at 70 million years, it stops subsiding as we expect. So that's just the, the actual depth of the ocean, right? Uh, the actual you know, thick, yeah, the thickness of the ocean. So that is really interesting in itself, and that stops at around 70 million years. Um, the cause of that is actually debated. Um, it's like one of these fundamental observations. And then, and then how the lithosphere, the base of the plate, um, relates to that is, is the great question of this, these experiments that we're, we're hoping to do. Is because uh, whether or not that compositional boundary that perhaps causes that, um, that, that kind of shallowing at 70 kilometers, um, it persists all the way to the ridge is not well known. And there's some debate, you know, basically between seismologists and um, people who do magnetotellurics and things like this. So, um, yeah, and, and other ideas for like why a plate stops subsiding at 70 million years are things like, well, maybe all of that ocean has been perturbed somehow by things like hot spots and, you know, upwellings that have melted it and, and altered it in some way. So, you know, exactly why that happens is still debated. Yeah. Any other questions? So, I guess not. So, let's thank our speaker again.